Let's talk about survive until daylight. Does this zombie survival game make it until dawn or is it dead on arrival? Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to talk about Survive Until Daylight by Flyos. Now, this is a game I picked up at Ludicon in Montreal a while back. Uh, and in fact, it's this is the collector's edition that comes in a tin instead of a box. There's some deluxe component upgrades that I'll show you as we go through the game. This is a zombie survival game where players are working together, cooperating as the last remnants of humanity who are trying to survive through the night against six waves of zombie attacks. Uh, survive Until Daylight is a game that works for between one and six players. You've got to be a little bit older for this one, age 14 and up, I would say. Uh, and games take half an hour to an hour to play. Let's take a deeper look at Survive Until Daylight by Flyos. Survive Until Daylight is, is light, I would say, in terms of its complexity, though it is still strategic. It's light, the rules are fairly simple and easy to understand. Your goal here in the base game is to survive through the night. Uh, there's going to be six waves of zombie attacks that you have to make it through. If any player gets eliminated, that's game over. So there's not really player elimination where one person is going to sit and watch everyone play. If one of these heroes dies, that's it. You didn't make it through the night and the game is done. You've lost. You start this one by choosing your character. There are these player boards that have a backstory on the back uh, and they've got your player stats on the front. It's asymmetric. Each character has two abilities, one that they can use on any turn and one that they can only use if they're the first player. The game has this great, I really like this token, this great sheriff's badge as a first player token. This is a big, thick, heavy metal piece that goes right there on your board. You might be able to tell uh, it's not a dual layer player board, but there's some textures. It's textured on all the spaces where you're going to need to put a component. Uh, so the, there's a little spot here for that first player token and you can feel it as you're, as you're putting, as you're sliding the pieces across the player board. So it keeps things in the right places, but it's, these are not dual layer boards, of course. Each of the characters has their own unique weapon. You're going to grab that weapon at the start of the game before uh, everything begins. And then you're going to grab one other weapon. And that gives you an opportunity, if you're a character like the pillar here, who carries a bat with nails in it, that you can get you know, a bow with some arrows or something like that. You don't actually get the ammunition. You only get the weapon. And you need ammo in order to fire it. And that's kind of where uh, the actual gameplay comes in. Each round of Survive Until Daylight, you're going to add a certain number of these cards to a little stack in the middle of the table. One at a time, starting with the first player, you're going to draw a card from that stack. Now, not all of the cards are good. You might break a bone or get bitten by a rat. Um, a lot of the time, you're just going to get junk. Some of the characters have an ability that allows them to use junk. Uh, one of them, this fellow here, can use junk in place of an ingredient if they're trying to craft a trap or a grenade or something like that to attack the zombies with. These three characters are really the ones that we found most effective uh, when we played the game. This combination allowed us to win, actually, was the only time we won, because uh, it, it is a pretty tough one. Once you've chosen your character, <laughs> and you've gotten your starting weapons, well, then the game is going to begin. What you're doing in this game is you're taking from this big stack of cards a smaller stack that you're going to put in the middle of the table for everyone to draw from. These You're rummaging around in the post-apocalypse to try and find things that are going to be useful to protect you against those zombie attacks. There might be things like vitamins that will increase your effectiveness in combat, an energy drink that will allow you to take an extra damage to craft or to do an extra attack. Um, a lot of the time what you're going to get is junk that's not really going to be helpful unless you have a special ability or a weapon that uses junk. Luckily enough, we often would take the slingshot that uses junk as ammo. Um, but also there's a character here, this basketball player, who can use junk in place of another ingredient when crafting. You could also obtain some crafting ingredients from that stack. Explosives or planks that will allow you to build barricades, nails or shards where you can build spears and things. There's, there are a number of different things you can build. Conveniently, 
each of those crafting cards indicates what it can be used, what cards it needs to be combined with in order to build which item on your turn. So it makes it super easy. You won't find yourself continually going back to the rule book to say, well, what do I need to go along with this card uh, in order to create something? If you're really unlucky, you might be digging through that pile of junk and find a rat attack. You might break a bone. There might be a crow who's going to take one of your items. You do have a limited number of items you can carry, including your two weapons. Uh, you can carry a maximum of eight things, although there is a backpack in the game that allows you to carry a little bit more and can prevent things from being stolen. Really, the game's going to start once this card gets drawn. So shuffled into that small deck of cards that you're putting into the middle of the table, and each round you're going to be adding more to that pile. If you haven't taken them all, you're adding a, a certain number of cards back to that pile. This wave card is going to get shuffled in each time. When the player draws the wave card, that's when the zombies are going to attack. Now you could, though, take one damage in order to shuffle that wave card back in and that allows you to grab a few more things before the wave begins. That is a very important ability in this game, but your health is super limited too, unless you're lucky enough to get granola bars or a can of peaches or soup or something that allows you to recover some of that health. When the wave begins, you're going to have a deck of these assault cards that have been shuffled up. That's going to dictate how many of each creature are going to be attacking. So de depending on the number of players, you've got numbers here on the side of, of each of these cards that are going to go in the line that's attacking you. We always found that we could never take them all out. So each round they're stacking up and there's more and more of these creatures that you have to protect yourself from and eliminate in order to win the game. Once that wave begins, really what's happening here is it's sort of a tower defense game. First, the players are going to begin before the monsters get to attack. You get to take out as many as you can to try and mitigate the damage that's going to happen to you from this wave of zombies. So each player, starting with player one, is going to get to trade a card. You can throw a card to another player. You only get one trade though. So if you've got maybe one crafting ingredient, you want to throw it to the person who's going to be able to use that card. Uh, but you can only do that once before the battle starts and then one at a time starting with the first player then you're going to start figuring out which of these monsters are you going to try to attack and you're choosing do I want to attack on this turn or craft if you craft a trap these are fantastic they do four damage to whatever monster is attacking you and if you kill it you take no damage at all uh, the spears are really good if you've got shards and some wood you can build the spear it'll do th three damage to a creature, but then each attack that hits that creature later on is going to do plus one extra damage. So this is a good one to throw maybe at those big monsters that uh, can take eight damage before you're taking them out. Uh, barricades are very helpful because they'll get destroyed when a monster hits it, but if a monster does hit your barricade, uh, then you're not going to take any, any damage from that monster. Unfortunately though, these big brutes that have the orange background, they can reach over barricades. They're too big. So barricades don't help against those guys. Now, if you were lucky during that round when you're run, rummaging around in that deck of junk to find some ammo for your weapons, well, that's going to be helpful when you decide to attack. You have to spend one of these cards in order to use those ranged weapons, whether they're guns or your bow and arrow. You want to make sure you've got some ammo. And in the trade phase, that's another thing that we were always throwing around to make sure people had what they needed in order to get through and do as much damage as possible to these creatures that are attacking. So if I had a character who had a gun and had this ammo, what's going to happen when I attack? The gun does three base damage, then I'm going to draw one of these cards. Now these cards do go up to three. There's lots of ones and twos in there. There are some minus ones and minus twos as well, so you might do less damage. Drawing this card is great because you do one extra damage to the zombie you attack and you do one damage to each of the creatures beside it. Once all of the players have taken their turn, the surviving zombies are going to start attacking. The first one in the row is going to attack any survivors. These are the guys, the kind of the slow pokes, uh, that, that might get taken out pretty quickly. If you're lucky to draw maybe a minus one, if this is the creature that's attacking, well then it does no damage and the survivor will stick around until next time. And that means you're going to have two zombies who will attack survivors instead of your heroes here, the player's characters. 
one of the really important things in this game is manipulating the order of the zombies and how they're going to attack to make sure that you're going to maybe do the most damage with the trap or make sure that the barricade is effective rather than having a brute attack the person with the barricade you want to shift things around as much as you can whether that's by cheering and and taking the wave card or maybe it's by uh, the pillar here her ability is that she can shift she can swap this, the locations of two zombies in the wave so that really does like you'll be sitting and kind of discussing among yourselves as the players how best to organize this attack in order to survive it and we had a lot of fun playing that part of the game once each of the surviving zombies have done their attack you push the survivors who are remaining over to the edge then you pull out another deck another stack of these cards you know in the games that we played we were dealing out 16 of these and shuffling the wave card in and the next round starts so there are six rounds in the game and I know when I first started looking at the rules, I was thinking, well, how am I going to keep track of six rounds? I always forget to move the round counter. But what's great about this is that there are six actual assault cards, so you know exactly when the game is over, when the last one is drawn. And the game is going to finish when either one of your players dies or you've taken out the last zombie in the row. So you might get to the last round and you might not kill all of the zombies. Well, then you can do another round of searching and just keep attacking. There's nobody else that's going to be added to the line. What skills are you practicing when you play Survive Until Daylight? Uh, well, it is, I mean, there's so much budgeting in this game and planning. Uh, it's, it's really generated some cool discussions among the players. I was playing with my son and his friends. I played with my gaming group as well. And there was always a, like a lengthy discussion and kind of saying, well, if we did this, this is what would happen. And you're really planning ahead. You're carefully budgeting your inventory items uh, and you're carefully budgeting your trades because you can only throw one thing to, to another player before the beginning of each wave. Uh, you're, you're managing whether you're going to craft or not and making some choices about uh, do I attack or do I build something. Um, so whenever you're planning and budgeting and you're trying to tackle things in an organized way, what we're talking about are the executive functioning skills, the skills and behaviors that you need to work towards a goal. You have to have an eye for detail. You have to be able to kind of exercise some judgment about your your actions and then kind of follow through on a plan. So this really is about those executive functioning skills, even though at the start of the game, you're just drawing a card. You also, because you're drawing those cards, because there's so much randomness, you are also needing to adjust your plan on the fly. So you'll finish a wave and you'll say, well, okay, this next time, here's the kinds of things that we need to think about doing. If somebody draws that wave card, we want to make sure we take that damage and, and keep going. But because those cards are random, you constantly are adjusting. I remember sometimes, you know, after the fourth or fifth wave, we might have one character who said, well, you know, I can draw a rat attack and survive, but if I break a bone and take two damage, that's it. The game is over. So we really were like holding our breath sometimes before we drew those cards because we'd have to adjust things uh, as we played. Sometimes there would be some healing items in that stack and what the wrong person would draw them and then you had to think about how am I going to trade this off uh, so you have to be able to adapt your plan you, you need to generate a plan and the steps to carry it out and then you need to be adaptable and whenever we're talking about that flexible problem solving that's a skill called fluid reasoning which is exactly that logical thinking and problem solving coming up with the steps to reach a goal and carrying those steps out. Um, so fluid reasoning is another skill that you're practicing here. Of course, you're also cooperating. I mean, you're working on that cooperation. You're speaking together about your plan. Hopefully, you're not going to have one player who's just going to dominate the discussion and say, you do this and you do that. It, it was always in the games that we played a collaborative discussion. And once the plan was developed, everyone did take the steps and did the things that they agreed to do. It's possible you might get a player who's a little less agreeable and they might do something different than, than what the plan was at the beginning. But in the games that we played, there, there was a lot of that cooperation and, and problem solving happening collaboratively. So you're working on that social skill of cooperation and talking things through. Final thoughts about Survive Until Daylight. Uh, this is a game where, you know, the reason why I picked this thing up is because the artwork was really appealing to me. It reminded me of those indie comics, those zombie comics from, from back in the day that I used to read. 
I love the artwork. I thought it was fun that you've got a backstory to these characters and they've got nicknames like the psycho and the hipster. The components are neat. The artwork is great. It's very thematic. You've got wave after wave of zombies and it does get more complicated because you're not killing them all each round. So the, the monsters are starting to pile up and attacking you every time. So it's tense. You're, you're holding your breath before you draw that card. You're holding your breath before you draw the combat card. It might be like, okay, if I draw anything other than a one, uh, anything lower than a one, we're not going to be able to win this round. Uh, and so you might get lucky, you might get unlucky when, when you're taking a chance like that. Uh, so it's tense, it's thematic, it's got great artwork. The deluxe components I really like. So in, wooden pieces instead of the cardboard cutouts are great. That big coin for the first player token, uh, I really like this as well. And it looks like a sheriff's badge, so that makes it extra fun. The fact that they've got some texture on the boards where you're going to be putting your health tracker or the first player token is something else that I really like. So, so this is a game that I think it's gorgeous. And the pieces are fantastic. It's thematic intense, which is just what you want, I think, from a co-op game. Uh, and it, it surprised me, honestly, because I looked at the art and I, I saw these characters and I thought, oh, well, I need to at least try this thing and see what this thing's all about. Um, and then I'm looking at the rules saying, okay, well, you're spending the first part of each round just drawing cards, just going around the circle and drawing cards. That's kind of random. But it was fun and tense, that, those card draws, because you might get something bad or you might be hoping to get that granola bar so that you can survive another round. Um, so even the card draws were fun and everybody was kind of on the edge of their seat through the entire thing. There is also um, a lot of customizability here not just with the characters that you're choosing and their asymmetric abilities. There's an expansion to this thing that really ramps things up. You can alter and make easier or more difficult any part of the game. Uh, you can turn it into a, a secret identity or a hidden role game where one of the players is kind of working against the rest. He's, he's a secret raider and you've got some hidden role cards and you have to figure out who's sabotaging the group. Uh, there are a couple of extra characters in here and one of them has the ability to heal uh, their teammates. There's um, There are some goals that you can achieve so you can be competitive rather than cooperative and it can be semi cooperative where you're trying to get the most points or achieve certain goals to get victory points but you're still working together to make sure you survive to the end. There are extra mods where you can make parts of the game easier or harder. Um, so it's customizable, it's super replayable, you've got a huge stack of these cards and you're not going to get to go through them all so you might not get the backpack. We didn't see the backpack at all in our first game, we died before we ever got to draw that card. Um, there's different weapons to choose from, so tons of replayability. I think that the expansion is great but we did not need the expansion to enjoy the game. We enjoyed it nonetheless. If there are, are downsides, I mean there are nitpicky downsides maybe. <laughs> One is that Boy, it was hard for me to learn the name of this game. For whatever reason, Survive Until Daylight never stuck in my head. I was thinking Survive Until Dawn, Survive Until Daybreak. At one point I said Survive Until Midnight, I think, in one of the group texts about playing the game. Um, so it, it's a name that was hard to, to stick with me. Um, the only other thing I can think of is that you've got this little box of these deluxe components, and the com these deluxe components are fantastic. When you look at the the organizer inside that big tin or inside the regular box, there's some spots for you to put the barricades and grenades and things like that so that everything can fit together. They fit the cardboard punch outs. These wooden pieces don't fit. So you still need that extra box in order to keep everything organized. That's certainly not the end of the world. I can have these two extra boxes just fine. I could get rid of the organizer if I wanted to, but I rarely do that. Um, the other thing I think that might be a downside for some players, other than, you know, like every cooperative game, you might get that alpha player at the table. That wasn't a problem in the games that we played. I mean, you just have to curate your group, I guess. Um, but the other thing I think that might grind your gears is that uh, there's a lot of randomness here. You've got the card draws. Well, first, even before you draw a card, you're kind of taking only a small subset of cards from that big deck and those are going in the pile. There's no way to manipulate the deck other than um, taking a damage to put the wave card back in so that you can grab some more stuff before the zombies start attacking. 
Um, there's a lot of randomness here to these cards as well with that minus two. There's a, a three damage card where you'll take damage yourself in order to do that three damage or one where you have to lose an item in order to do this maximum damage. Uh, so there, there's a lot of randomness. For some players that's going to be a deal breaker. It was not for us. This was a game where everyone sitting around the table was engaged from the second the first card got drawn until the final wave, uh, constantly talking and trying to solve and figure things out. We had so much fun playing this game. So thanks so much to Flyos. This was a game that I purchased, but they did upgrade my, my purchase to the collector's edition. Uh, so they were very kind in that way. Thanks so much to Flyos for sharing this with me and kind of showing me the ropes a little bit because I, you know, I, I, I've never heard of this game until I went to Ludicon and met these guys. Um, what a fantastic experience. We had a lot of fun playing this one. If you have any questions or comments, you can, of course, leave them in the comments section below the video, or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca. Brainsongames.ca is the website. That's where future episodes will go. Previous ones are up there already. Brains on Games is the X handle and the Blue Sky handle and the Facebook page and the Instagram feed, so we're all over the place. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones, you can head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me. Hopefully I'll see you next time.